he was a quiet man, an artist, a craftsman, very conscious of his surroundings, a landscape artist mostly at that time. So he taught me to observe nature, to see the beauty of what was in front of me. Nothing elaborate, just the hedges, the trees, the grass. To notice the sky. He was also very conscious of good work. He loved carpentry. He taught me how to use tools. And I remember so well him saying, pay attention, keep your eye on what you're doing. When you're sawing a piece of wood, listen and watch the move, listen to and watch the movement of the saw. Watch the hammer so you hit the nail straight. And these two lessons of 100% giving attention and observing what was around me have stood me in good stead all my life. They're wonderful qualities which mm. are probably quite rare these days, which is sad. But that's the way the world is. And, and what did you get from your mother? Mum was Russian. Well, she was also an artist in her way. She was a housewife, of course. Um, that's what women were then. <laughs> they called themselves there and were proud of it. Mum was always, when women's lib came in, she, she said, there's nothing wrong with being a mother and a housewife. <laughs> anyway. Well, what I got from Mum was primarily a Russian heart. And Russian hearts, they just spill out all over the place. Mm -hmm. I was always told as a child, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Well, people laughed at me, but it's one of the best things to have a great heart and to that. A great heart. To, work, to sleeve, work from yeah. the heart, to, rec to recognize the existence of the heart. And, uh, and the whole household shone with that tender, loving care that emanates from her. Someone that loves their work and gives themselves to it. The way the table was laid, the way she knitted our clothes for us, did the mending, did the washing up, everything was a work of art and done with love. And now at seven years old, you were sent to boarding school and that yes. was a little bit of a shock, but you would escape to the chapel and pray when needed, didn't you, <laughs> to, find your, to find your solitude and balance again. It was a shock because up till then we lived in the deep country and I hardly knew what another little boy was. Um, my companions were nature and animals and I was suddenly thrown into this world of other little boys and I was completely lost and for the first time in my life I knew what it was to feel isolated and lonely. Thank God the school was in a rural setting, so there were big gardens where I could go. And, and, uh, and also, in my little childish way, I remember so well just burying my little head in my hand and closing my eyes and saying, God bless Mummy and Daddy and my sister and our dog. And what a haven of, a haven of home and security that was for me. It seems even at an early age you had a way of going inside and finding somewhere that you could rest, as you put that, yes. used the word haven just now. Yes, I think that probably was so, um, or if not inside, at least to stillness and quietness. I mean, in nature it's outside, isn't it? You look at a tree, you put your arms around a tree and you're held in stillness, in quietness in that reassurance of, of just simply being itself. That's what a contrast it is to the, the noise and, the, and the, uh, the agitation that you get from most people. And you actually you talk about, I don't know if you remember the beginning of this book, you talk about it's a book about committed to discovering stillness? Well, I wouldn't say that. No, it's really a book to dis uh, committed to discovering. Well, I don't know what really. It's, uh, if I use clever words like the infinite and, or even God at, 
as a young man, I wasn't, I still don't know really what they are. Who doesn't know what God is? <laughs> Nobody knows what God is. But, but there's, how can I put it? Perhaps one longs for the unlimited, for freedom and, uh, and for love. And in inworldly experience, all these things are finite, they have an end. You go out, you discover freedom, go out and climb a mountain, but then you've got to come home again. Love is wonderful in its flowering, but then sooner or later it says no, it has an end. Um, all the things you long for happiness, it all comes and goes, doesn't it? And I think uh, perhaps I was just greedy, I wanted that which didn't end. Um, but sometimes we need that, you call it greed, that commitment well, to find that Absolutely. That's the motivation, isn't it? Yeah, well, come on, come on to that a bit later. I want to just go through your story a little bit sequentially and just mm. see the important, to uh, discover these important pointers in your life. So, you know, there's so much we could do because you are now 79 years old. There's so much mm. we could talk about, but I'm going to summarize it to some extent. You, um, were an army officer, which mm. I guess was national service, mm. involved in a family business. And then in 1963, you went to South America. Yes. What's the reason you went to South America? Oh, I wanted to make the world a better place. <laughs> what was your vision of making the world a better place? Well, I was place? a farmer. Yeah. I, I'd uh, loved farming since almost my first breath. I was soaked in farming. I, 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 had, I just wanted, wanted to be a farmer, it was my overriding sort of dream really. Um, and, uh, and I'd spent some time, I'd studied the subject, and uh, it was the time when these charities like Oxfam were just beginning, and, and so it was in sort of the fashionable thing really, I suppose. Uh, I had a, another mate and we were going out to Bolivia, we were going to take a, they were giving grants of a thousand hectares to new settlers who'd go out and grow food for the hungry. So we thought we'd go out and do that. We were young and strong. Um, but my maid didn't come. He, he, he met a, a girl that stayed in England and I met a Peruvian girl and, and her father invited me to go and work for him in Peru. So I did that. But uh, on a big sheep, uh, Hacienda. But that was my time of, sort of socialist time of my life and uh, I wanted to do good so I ended up working as a volunteer agriculturist in the mountains of Peru. This must have been beautiful actually. Well it was, uh, I wouldn't say it was easy but uh, it, it, there was plenty of space up there and I loved that. I loved the donkeys and the oxen and uh, yes I, I, was, I was, it was a good year. I, but. Uh, I think like most people who've done voluntary service, <coughs> it, uh, I learnt, it gave me much more than I gave to it really. And I learnt probably the greatest lesson of my life. I remember sitting on a mountainside one day, I, I'd done a lot of work, a little bit of work with planting trees on eroded mountainsides. And of course the local sheep and goats had come and eaten them all off and I was sitting there a bit depressed. And it seemed that some a little voice seemed to say to me, to make whole, be whole. Make whole, To be make whole, be, be whole. whole. Well, I hardly understood what that was then. But I had read a little bit about meditation, not that I really understood it. But I saw myself as a mixed up young man, trying to help people, the local Indians, older and wiser than myself, and more able to live. And I realized I had to do something about sorting out myself before I could be much use to others. So having read a bit about meditation, when I came home to England, I looked for and I found a school of meditation. I want to just point out one more thing that I thought was important in your book was there was uh, a situation you were in the mountain uh, the jungle I think mm. in Peru and you felt the only way was to surrender oh, do you yes. remember that that was quite <laughs> important I think yes we 
I had a pal, and uh, and uh, and and uh, we found a, an Indian who'd take us. And we had several days in the jungle, just walking through the jungle. Which was it must have been an incredible experience. It was an incredible experience. Yeah. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, the jungle's very thick. It's quite difficult to walk through. Yes. It's mostly uh, uh, these great trees above. There's very little sunlight comes down to the forest floor. You creep along over the fallen leaves and these huge lizards and snails and, and snakes. You see monkeys up in the trees. And at one point we uh, came to a little creek with a sandy, sandy banks and there was a great uh, sort of furrow gouged out of this sand as though someone had dragged a big oil barrel through it. And, uh, and uh, we looked at the guide and it was a huge snake, an anaconda. Huh. And I wanted to follow up and, and find it but he wouldn't let me. He said it would be lying curled up ready to grab us. Yeah. And, uh, and then it started to rain and we camped just, just near there, just, uh, just beside it. And uh, um, just made a little fire, it was sleeping on the ground there. And um, I didn't sleep very well. I, I think I, maybe I woke up in the middle of the night and, and the rain had cleared. And you know, the jungle's full of, of, of shrieks and funny sounds, rustlings at night. It's like all the animals come out and move around. And I, lay, I sat there by the campfire in this little circle of light and thought of this great snake. I could reach out and touch it probably, for all I knew. And I began to feel fear. He would, we're alone in this jungle. If the Indian deserted us, God knows what we'd have done. And then quite unexplicably, I just, Perhaps I stopped fighting, I gave up the struggle, I surrendered. I just relaxed into the situation as it was, into the unknown. And I suddenly felt peace, such as I'd never felt before. Just total peace, in which all the threats that surrounded us were contained and all right. And I look back on that as one of my first great spiritual experiences. Yes. You say in the book, I put my trust in forces greater than me. Yes. Yeah. Which we all have to do, don't we, sometimes, in a if way, not all the time. <laughs> in a way that I've been yeah. doing it all my life. That, yes. that is the essence. Yeah. Putting your trust in forces greater than you. That's right. Yeah. Do you feel that peace now? Absolutely. Yeah. Of course, I'm nervous before an interview, what do I do? I just find that stillness yeah. and I feel confident. Yeah. It's like an invisible hand to hold, a rock. So how do you find the stillness? How do I find it? Well, it can't be described. No, but you said you were nervous, maybe before the interview, yes. so you how find that find stillness. It? Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've had many years of practice, it's just second nature to me now, probably my first nature. It's so obvious, we're sitting in it like fishes in the sea. You can never not be still. But the trouble is, we just don't see it. We, we, we look down and we just live in this cocoon of, bit of mental agitation, lost in thought. That's the human condition, at least what we call the human condition. But actually, it's, it's lost. It's not, it's not reality at all. It's not what we are, and this is the cause of all our problems. We're absent from the presence of God. And this, in a way, the groundwork was what your father was teaching you. Yes, that also to be present. Things, watching the nail. To be present. The saw, the wood. That's right. Yeah. The present is, is such an important word. Yeah. Now, the present moment, here and now the present moment. You can hear the church clock chiming, can't you? I can. It's sounding in stillness, isn't it? It's one o'clock. In yeah. stillness and in timelessness. Time goes round, yeah. round and round, in eternal presence. The peace of God that passeth understanding. 
right here and now. We can never be closer to God than right here and now. Okay, so I'm going to keep going with your story, see what else comes out of that. So as you were just starting to, to stay, when you got back from South America, mm -hmm. you were 27, and you discovered the School of Meditation in yes, London. Yes, yes. Tell us about that, how you discovered it, or not so much how you discovered it, but how was it important to you? Well, <clears throat> it certainly was very important. <clears throat> yes, I had to go to London to be taught, I was taught. Um, the first practice, I, I, I still, I had a, my first farm was at Bakewell then, so I had to get the late night train back from London to look after my animals next morning. And I was sitting in St Pancras Station waiting room, among all the rubbish and uh, unfortunate drunks and homeless that, that, that used it. And I, I sat and closed my eyes and meditated as I'd been told. And there and then, in that seemingly uncongenial situation, it opened up like that. And I th realized that all the space, the freedom that I longed for, that I'd been traveling the world to find in the deserts and mountains of this world, were within me. And that discovery that and that discovery well, has been going on all ever since. Bigger and bigger, greater and greater, better and better. So the discovery was the beginning of something in a way. It was the beginning of realization. Yes. Of course, I had the theory. I was I was brought up in a Christian school. I, I, I had ten years of compulsory chapel and scripture lessons. I, I knew a lot of the Bible by heart and the old prayer book. The kingdom of God is within you. I, you know, I'd learnt that, but what did it mean? I didn't really know. But, but very soon, in those first few periods of meditation, I realised that there was this dimension that was not of this, or not of what we call this world. There was a, 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 a further dimension that could be realised. That's the word, realisation. Mm. You know, the, the, the biblical phrase comes alive. Um, the kingdom of God, what does that mean? Well, I don't know, it's difficult to say even now. But, but it's within you, it really is within. And the peace of God that passes understanding, it's beyond the thinking mind. You, you, you don't get it by, by you know, substituting one thought for another, but by opening up to this dimension of spirit, really. That's what it is. Invisible, you can't describe it. Everybody knows what silence is. No one can describe it. Who knows I'm what silence is? I'm not sure that is. everyone knows what silence is, actually. They think it's mm. just not hearing any noise. Well, exactly. Exactly. I think it's... Uh, we'll go into more detail yes. later, but I mm. think that the, it's almost an art to silence somehow. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I know you had some, again, important experiences which helped deepen your realis realisation. There was one time when you were, the, I think, on the underground train in London, mm -hmm. where you saw everyone as Jesus, is that right? Well, I know I used the word when I described it. I'm not sure really what I meant by it. Um, I think the words Jesus and Christ so often get used with very nebulous meaning, and different people, of course, mean, mean it in different ways. But I think what I, how I would describe it now, as far as I remember, it was a realization of this, of this stillness. That there, in the, the, that, that this underground carriage was was full of this stillness, and within this stillness, the bodies, the personalities, the sounds took place, and actually, pervade, pervaded everybody whether they realised it or not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you look at people's eyes, every, every eye shines with more or less light, even if the eye's very dulled. It's the same light, isn't it? How many lights are there? There's only one light, isn't there? <laughs> and uh, um, so it is, there's only one stillness, there's only one spirit. And, and, and I think that these uh, first experiences of mine um, were like that. 
um, and so Korea. You had, an, you had another time when I think you're also in London, where even you saw the garbage is beautiful. Yes, yes. It, well, it, well it, again, everything was shining. If, if uh, it depends what you're focused on. There are levels of consciousness. Um, you know, if your heart is light, if your heart is full of light, you see light, and everything that's in it is light. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? If your eye is full of beauty, that's what you see. Yes, but I think it was also important from what you explained in, in the book about that realization. That I'm just trying to trying to find the words here that that forced you to review some deeply oh, negative yes. attitudes towards civilization yes, and city life. Absolutely. Well, yes, as I, as I said, being a country boy, I was, I was, um, I was at that time very negative about, about city life. Yes. That was the, sort of the worst of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we used words like townies to describe those not fortunate enough, enough to live in the country. And civilization was the very, very um, antithesis of nature unnatural wasn't it and uh, and so th these were some of the, the great lessons I had to overcome and uh, and certainly meditation did help to clear out some of those negative thoughts uh, from my mind but unfortunately there are many many more of them deeply buried inside it's a long process <laughs> it is a long process and I think that one of the things that comes across certainly in your book and your story is this motivation, this determination to keep going mm. somehow? You didn't give up, and uh, well, let, let's go through the story, and, and we'll we'll kind of come to examples of this. So, in your thirties, you uh, you actually thought of becoming a monk at one point. You were in and out of monasteries, yes, yes, so yeah. you were searching still in the Christian tradition, I guess. There. Um. Yes, I, I don't remember too clearly what my motivation was. I think, uh, I think perhaps it was a reaction. Uh, you know, I just didn't want to be what most of my contemporaries were. I didn't want to go into business. I didn't want to go into the professions. Uh, I didn't. Um, monastic life seemed to offer a, an alternative. But it, that, was, that was about the same time that I learned to meditate. And it certainly raised the question, do I follow this way or the way of meditation? I don't see any conflict now, but then I did. It seemed an either-or situation. By the way, at that time, um, things have changed a lot in the last 50 or 60 years. The church was really quite suspicious of meditation. It, um, no, it, it, uh, it regarded it as something Eastern, which is really very odd, <laughs> but it did. Um, I suppose I was caught up in that. But anyway, I decided to stay with meditation because even in those early months, I realized, or I felt it was, at least for me, a more effective way of spiritual work. There was also, you know, you say more than once in the book that you're your two loves at that point were meditation and farming and animals yes. and there's a lovely example you gave of at one point you had to sell your farm and you were quite sad about that yes. and you were just sitting feeling it and this ram came over to you just yes. talk us through what happened there excuse me may i just jump back for a moment to make a, a, a little comment about that decision about meditation um the accusation is often made that meditation is a withdrawal from this world. But absolutely on the contrary, the key principle of the method of, that I taught was that you practice it while living in the world. A, a monkish life may possibly be considered a withdrawal from life, from worldly life. But meditation, absolutely not. It's, it's the art of finding the eternal in the midst of, in the marketplace, the stillness in the movement. To be 
I forget the exact phrase, but to be, I think it's in the world, but in not the, of the absolutely. world. Absolutely, that's, 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 yeah. that's the good phrase, in the world, but not yeah. of the world, yes. I understand and it's that. utterly practical, yeah. and it's absolutely not a withdrawal, an opting out of, of, of yeah. that's a completely that's, different understanding. I've read many things over mm. the years uh, that about monks who've spent mm. years meditating in very mm -hmm. confined places like a cave or a yes. monastery, and they come to the city mm. and they're lost. Yes. And what you're saying is it, it, that that stillness, that presence, it's, 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 in, right, it's right in the marketplace in the city. Yes, in the most chaotic imaginable yeah. situation. Yes. Yes. God is with us. Yes. I'm going to insist on the story about the ram. Yes, I love I'll the come story. back to that. Yes, so do I. <laughs> but it's one of those wonderful things I've got no explanation for. But um, at that time, one of the great loves of my life are sheep. Um, I could tell you a lot about my understanding of the Lamb of God. <laughs> anyway, um, at that time I had a, a, a quite a considerable flock of sheep, about 150 sheep, and I uh, had uh, five rams, I think. And uh, one of these rams was an old warrior where he, through much fighting, he'd split his skull and was an <laughs> um, old soldier. Um, and just before uh, th things happened, I had to sell, move on from my first farm. Um, and I was sitting at one side of a field. I'm not sure if I'd been crying, but I was very unhappy about it all, losing my beloved man an animals. And, and these rams were lying under a hedge on the other side of the field, about, I suppose, 100 yards or so away. And, and to my, my amazement, one of these rams, this old warrior, he stood up, he left the others. Slowly and deliberately he walked across the field. He laid his head in my lap and just stood there for a, a minute or two or three. Mm. Then he turned away and went back and laid back there with his companions. Mm. It brings tears to my eyes to tell you. Well, what do you make of that? Perhaps I shouldn't. make of that, that extraordinary connection that you had or have with nature, which is everyone's potential in a way. Yeah. Well, maybe that was it. Anyway, yeah. I think consider that one of the yeah. greatest honours of my life. Yeah. What could one ask Greatest honour of your life. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> See? Russian heart come brings tears to my eyes. Yes. <laughs> Even in front of a camera, sorry. <laughs> well, you have a bit of an up and down story in some ways and I'm going to now move on because in your late forties your life fell apart mm -hmm. and you had quite bad depression. Mm -hmm. How did that start? Oh, well, I had a second farm then. It was a, it was a lovely little farm. That's really another story. And I, I was a, I was happy as a farmer. I was married by then and had a good wife. Um, but we had many meditation students at that time used to come to the farm. I was quite well known as one of the first organic farmers. Um, there was a woman that came to meditate and on one occasion, we meditate with closed eyes by the way, so we, we were sitting together, we'd, we'd just come to stillness and I saw our two souls rise from our bodies and merge as one. She was a woman with very open, clear eyes and when I looked at her, I saw right through to the infinite beyond. So what does that mean? What does that the mean? The infinite beyond. What did you actually see? Well, you've got to realize there are two sorts of sight. There's the eyes of flesh, 
and there's what's called insight, seeing with the eyes of the heart. Insight is always limited. I mean, fleshly sight is always limited. It has a boundary. Flesh sees flesh. But we all have, to some extent, a, a sense of even indescribable beauty or indescribable peace or something like that. What did I see? I saw the indescribable right there. I saw the infinite indescribable. But it's the realest of the real when you see it. Mm. And what really tipped me back into, tipped me into depression was that I was still a young man, a hot-blooded young man. Um, still, you know, very much living in my physical body and in my, in my human emotion. How do you reconcile the two? There was that spiritual uni union, I feel like the mystical marriage, contrasted with two people living lives, both with their own marriages, their yes. homes, their jobs, yes. that were not, that were separate. How do you reconcile unity with separation? Um, well, I couldn't at that time. It was beyond my, my ability, my experience. Mm. I couldn't go back into that old life. Of course, I couldn't escape it either, really. I was sort of imprisoned in it. So it was an experience that took you out yes. of your world. That's right. Yeah. I suppose a modern jargon might say it blew my mind. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but it's not a phrase that I normally very, use. very accurate, it blew your mind. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I went back home, you know, and there was my dear wife, and, and but somehow it was all too small, I couldn't sort of, I'd, I'd been shown something. Well, anyway, the gist of it was, it threw me into a turmoil of emotions and and uh, and I left. I, I, I had to really break away. So I left. You had to leave your marriage. I, I left my farm. Yeah. I left my home. Wow. I I I, uh, I had a little one of the early motor caravans in that time, and I drifted around for some years, homeless, jobless, loveless, and alone. Mm. And um, it was a, a wretched time of life. I just picked fruit. I did what I could. But you'd um, had the you'd had that experience, so that I'd must had have that given vision. you yes. a reference point. It gave yes, you did. an opening. Because how do, how can one access it? Well, meditation, of course, does just that. Because in meditation, you if I can give you a demonstration, the beautiful demonstration of meditation, I hope the camera can see my hands, is just that. You see? It's just an opening. It's letting go. That's right. Letting go. Now yeah. this is how we live, forgetting, forgetful of yeah. the Trying one. To hold on. Of the one. We hold yeah. on. Yeah. We hold on to our personal life. And so we're imprisoned yes. within our ego, which is our sense of separation. Yes. Mm? And in meditation, it starts very gently at first, so it's not frightening or anything, but very gently it sort of helps you to do that. Yeah. Now, when you let go, you discover that you're not actually separate at all. You're united. You're in that which is undivided. Indescribable, but undivided. There's not two at all, there's just one. Mm. One love. One person. Singular. Adam in the paradise was singular. One. One I am. Now that's what I'd been shown in this dramatic episode with this woman, the oneness. Um, well, you could say that then the work, the real work began, because the two polarities had been clearly identified to me. Well, I, in, in, although I was too muddled really to put it as clearly as I'm saying to you now. But that's what gradually dawned on me. At, at one time with the motor caravan, I went and spent a winter in Spain, alone, of course. And I spent hour after hour after hour just meditating. I, mm -hmm. I, I moved from just doing the standard half hour, morning, morning and night, and meditation became 
salvation. Because in salvation you're taken out of this imprisonment and you're shown what real. You're, you're, you're saved from drowning in this world. Just like St. Peter was walking on water, he was drowning in the world. Mm. There was Jesus free beside him. Peter was drowning. He reached, he said, help me. Jesus said, what were you frightened about? What were you drowning for? Have faith. Have faith. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And you never stopped having faith, even though it was a difficult time. I don't think I ever did because yeah. I had this wonderful practice and this practice is such a wonderful way of putting it into practice. So twice every day without fail and for increasingly lengths of time I was just surrendering to that total presence mm. and to and to that love that has no end, to that love that never says no, to pure total love, which is which I'd seen in her eyes, you see, and yet the body, of course, said no. In a way, it wasn't mm. to do with her. No, well, she was a portal somehow. Just, it, it was, she, well, the body was a portal because yes. that, of course, isn't really what we are. And this yes. is the great discovery, that man is not limited to the flesh. The flesh, as the Bible tells us, is profit of nothing. Yes. The flesh is just, is just... Look, anything that dies, mortality, the whole world that comes to pass, is not what we are. Man is eternal being. Okay, I'm going to go back to your story mm. a little bit because I think it's important just to, mm. for people to see that your path wasn't always smooth, it had ups and downs. <laughs> and, and, how, and how you how you dealt with the downs, I think, is yes. so important and people somehow, yes. they get stuck on having the highs yes. of the, as yes. they see them, the experiences. Yes, exactly. yes, yes, yes. This practicality. Yes, of course. And, well, it's and, discipline that pulls you through. You've just got to keep was, on practicing, practice, it was a practice, discipline practice. You were in the motor home, but you kept the discipline and the meditation. Of meditation, yes. But in yeah. a way, it isn't difficult because it, it's it's a way. In a way, it's like when it's been described as a trail of grains of sugar. You know, it, it's it, it, you follow it because it leads. It's always leading you from better to better to better to better. From better to better yes. to better. It's, it's described yeah. as a trail of sugar, you see, yeah. leading to the sugar mountain, which is, of course, the kingdom of God. Yeah, but unfortunately in our society, there's so many false trails well, that try and take you better to better to better. I think you and want... all you end up is yeah. with an unhealthy body and a big overdraft <laughs> and credit card bills. And <laughs> well, that's why it's... It, it's you know, one of the, I think one of the impediments, one of the things that stops us setting out on the spiritual life is that we're not sufficiently unhappy. We're too content with this sort of compromise with life, with all the little, you know, sandwich bars and baubles that life, you know, offers to us, the comfort of a teddy bear. Um, and, you know, for some people it's not good enough. You want more, you want the real thing. I guess I was one of those people. Yes, but you also had what I would call the taste, not the taste is, is not a strong enough word, but you had visions in one way. You had big, big clues and not everyone has that. Well, yes, that's also true and, 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 and am I not blessed? Um, there is a blessing in that, you're absolutely, absolutely. right. You know, yeah. the, say, the, as the Bible tells us we are saved by grace. And yeah. what is grace? It, it's something that comes unseen, unknown. You know, it's like memory. Where does memory come from? Yes. It just comes, doesn't it? I think what we're going to do is we're going to do a part two in this interview because we have about 10 minutes left and mm. I'm only... So we'll keep going and there'll be a part two. Mm. So um, what happened 
next was in 1988. You went to Africa for a time. Yes, I, I was. Uh, I was offered a job out in Africa, South Africa. I went out there. The job didn't work out. So, uh, so after some time, um, I hired a little a little car, and uh, I just drove off. Um, I didn't really have a plan. I, I didn't even have a proper map, but I just followed the road, and it all unfolded in front of me. Um, I slept uh, in the back of the car, and uh, all out on the out on the ground, under the stars. Um, oh, I, I I absolutely loved it. The space, the glorious space, and uh, I you know I I. I, I, uh, I never went to any big towns, the little ones. I just bought what I had to buy and got out into the open again. <laughs> I just found the big empty spaces on the map and I went there. And, yes, uh, you come across in the book that it comes across that you're always drawn, as you say, to wide open, yes. preferably wild places. Yes. And, but for that time, but for the wind, there was utter silences that yes. you've never known before. Yes. There's no place for your depression anymore. No, I, I suppose I no out there. I, I think I, I was so thrilled by it. So uh, utter silence. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I just couldn't get enough of space and silence. I've always loved space. Yes. Space and silence. They're, they're just natural to me. I belong there. That's where I feel at home. But it seems to me that it's kind of from what you've told us so far about your life. It, it's like there's almost this dance of space and it's the a, you're drawn to the space on the outside you recognize the real space is primary on the inside mm -hmm. and you're in Africa and you're still of course completely attracted to the stillness of the space mm -hmm. nothing around for yes. miles and miles and miles yes yes I, I love actually love that when I was a boy at school, my favourite picture was of a cowboy riding up to the crest of a hill with the caption, don't fence me in. I loved that phrase. And Africa was, oh, it was in that sense. Um, yes, and then I went on, I was in the Kalahari in the Namibian desert and, and that, uh, oh, I just loved it. I, it, it, I, I always... It always sort of seemed to me obvious why the early, the early Christians, you know, why men of prayer went to the desert, and then I experienced it for myself, and and it, it's it's just all so obvious there. It's all just before you, the infinite, and you are nothing. You you're just taken into the immensity of of what's there. Because you talk in the book about there when you're in Africa, the absence of subject-object relationships. Yes, yes, yes. All so that just not, dies away. So there's not you and the other. No. It's just the one. That's all. All that dies away. All the personality is just nothing. Yes. Yeah. The the me, the John Butler, is just you forget about it. It's just nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you came back from Africa. Yes. To England. <laughs> what happened then? <laughs> well, you can imagine just the opposite. Getting back to, to, uh, um, well, I had to get back into John Butler again, <laughs> or what the world considered that to be. Um, and you found it tough again, didn't you? Well, uh, I, I, I uh, uh, you know, I'd lost my job as a farmer. I, I, I had to. I, I was desperate to find some sort of work. And um, for what on earth could I do? I, 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 I wrote a CV at that time, and uh, I remember more or less what I wrote. I wrote, I wrote something about I knew something about freedom, and therefore I could help others to freedom. Um, And of course, freedom is, is love. Love is freedom. The two are the, really the same thing, spiritually speaking. And uh, if someone could give me a channel for, for my love, I'd give my all. That was what I was looking for. And of course, who answered my CV? Yes, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> I was looking for 
I was, I was looking for, for freedom in the world of bondage. And, and but you'd also had the realisations before when you were in London and you saw the garbage is beautiful yes, and the yes. underground. It's somehow, the, the, you'd had the experiences, but something, it, it is hard, isn't it? And I'm, I'm just pointing out that yes. you, you, you had had these reference points, but you, you, you have this openness in Africa, mm. this, this stillness. Mm. John Butler's almost disappeared. Yes. And you get back to England and the reality of day-to-day -day life hits you again. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I suppose I hadn't, I see I was still, we're such spiritual infants, you know. Even now as an old man, I'm still a spiritual child. Spiritual child, yes. It's a long journey. Yes. And, and one's learning all the time. You learn something every day. And at that time, I was still grappling with questions that I had, that I, that now I no longer have these problems. But at that time I did. Um, you see, just, just to kind of, I just wanted to, people to understand where, where you really were. You kind of, you said again, you fell into personal desire. Uh, yes. You had to deal with what you call the cancerous root of egoism oh, yes. by exposing it bit by bit. How did you expose it bit yeah, by yes, bit, yes. a cancerous root of egoism? Yes, that's a good phrase. <laughs> um, how did I deal with it? Well, oh indeed. I'm not sure that we can deal with it, because you see, we, I, am the ego. So it's the ego trying to deal with the ego. Yes. It's the pot calling the kettle black. Mm. The blind leading the blind. We are saved by grace. Well, I meditated. Um, at that time, I met a teacher, a young man, and I looked in his eyes and I had that ex same experience of seeing the infinite beyond. You have with that woman. Freedom, yes. yes. Mm. And I followed him out to America. Yes. To San Francisco. I was that desperate. I knew that's what I wanted. I didn't want anything else. Mm. And so I, as it were, jumped off the precipice to him. Mm. And while I was in America, after I'd been with him a few days, I remember there was a big meeting and he looked at me and, uh, and he pointed out my pride, my arrogance and my egoism, which was completely crushed me. Mm. I was exposed in this room of, I suppose, a couple of hundred people. And Just I still repeat, that was, very, that was very faint. You exposed in front of... I suppose two or three hundred people. There was other people a big around. Hall in the room, yes. Yes. And I felt within me a monstrous, almost like a worm. And I didn't know what to do with it at all. I was absolutely terrified. And I fled. Mm. Where did I flee to? I fled into the wilderness. Mm. I, I, I got a car and I just drove into the desert and I thought I was going mad at that time. I had this such a sense of evil within me. I didn't know how to deal with it at all. I meditated but somehow even meditation didn't deal with it. And fearing I was really going to lose my, lose, lose my wits, I, I took a job as a cook in a, in a, in a funny little uh, uh, motel gas station and I worked in the kitchen there, um, frying eggs and things. Do you want me to go on? And this was in the Mojave Desert, which is just on the border of Arizona, um, surrounded by desert country. One day, I, I, after work, I walked up the side of the valley, 
there was this little motel, there was a little spot down in the bottom of the valley. I sat on a rock. And I think I, I, I put my head in my hands and I think I just, I just was finished then. And someone came and stood beside me. I didn't see anybody, I didn't hear anybody. No, no man was involved at all. But I felt there was a, a presence beside me. And I, I, I said, I, 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 I suppose it was Jesus. Mm. I've never doubted it. It was nothing to do with the church, nothing to do with religion at all. Mm. And uh, I didn't really notice any difference. Depression didn't end, but I wrote a poem. That's right. Depression didn't end, but from then on I had a friend. Huh. So I certainly didn't have any human friend at that time. Yes. And, uh, and then a few months, more months passed and I, I ended this job with a pocket full of money so once more I hired a car and had a wonderful time exploring the western states, the cowboy country and more animals and more beloved prairie. <laughs> then I came home right, and once again back in this awful abyss of not knowing I, I, what to do. I just want to, hmm? so we have, we have to finish, let's call this part one in a couple of minutes. but. So what the breakthrough was for you was the appearance of what you felt might have been, could be Jesus. It, it was about having a companion, a friend, a support, a guide. Is that, am I using the right words I here? I think you're making too much of it, Tom. Okay. I, 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 wouldn't have, I wouldn't use any of those words. It was, it was less defined. It was yes. very undefined. Um, Soon after I got back, I had some, some friends then that did healing and, and I remember they prayed over me and it was extraordinary. I found my, felt myself screaming. I was thrown to the ground mm. and something was expelled. Some revolting thing came out of my mouth. It opened my mouth so wide that my mouth split. But what came out? I never saw anything. Mm. I suppose one idea expelled by another. And just before that happened, actually, I'd been, um, I'd gone into a job centre and I was invited to an open day and I was invited to go to Nottingham University to study Russian as a very mature student. Okay. We're going to stop there because that's a great mm. start for part two. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for doing <laughs> part one. Thank you everyone for watching part one here with, uh, with John. And 